The ChemPhys section of the MCAT is by far one of the more complicated and intimidating portions of the exam, and today I'm going to be giving you an in-depth guide as to the tips and strategies that I utilized on the exam. I'll practice by applying those strategies, answering questions live on camera, and then I'll finish the video just by reviewing some key takeaways. Throughout the video, if you have any questions at all, please be sure to comment, or you can follow me on Instagram and you can ask me there. Lastly, if you are looking for an all-in-one study resource for the MCAT, study.com provides an incredible prep program, and right now you can get 35% off your first three three months using the link in the description below. All right, so let's get into it. So tip number one is that you wanna practice understanding what the question is actually asking of you. Oftentimes the MCAT presents you with incredibly wordy and lengthy research articles that are convoluted with this insane language, and they give you figures that are often really difficult to make sense of. And even the questions themselves can sometimes be confusing. Because of that, it can be extraordinarily helpful to reword the question. Ask it in a way that makes it easier to piece together and in a way that makes sense to you. You'll actually see in a moment that I choose to read the question first before I even look at the passage. This way I'm not bogged down and intimidated by all of the lengthy and confusing words. And by looking at the question first and understanding what it's asking of me, I can then go back to the passage and sort of dig through it and figure out what it is I'm trying to find out. The second tip that I like to give is that you need to remember and understand your equations from the inside and out. I really want to be careful though and emphasize that it's not enough to just memorize the equations. You really do need to take the time to understand them. What does that equation represent? How is it interconnected to the variables that it's trying to measure? The reason you need to take it one step further is because the MCAT expects this understanding. It'll often ask you to understand the effect of a treatment or a condition that affects one of these variables in a certain way. The easiest example I can think of is in an application of Poisset's law, which measures the flow rate of a liquid given certain parameters. Remembering the equation, you need to understand, well, what would happen if we doubled the radius of the vessel wall by two? How might this affect the flow rate? Now, by asking ourselves how this would affect the flow rate, we might mistakenly suggest that it would double the flow rate, because if we're doubling the radius, we just double the flow rate. But remember that in Poisset's law, we actually raise the radius to the fourth power. And so by doubling the radius of the wall, we'd actually be increasing the flow flow rate by 16 times. And so this is sort of a good example about how important it is for you to understand these equations and how to apply them, especially in the context of certain questions. So anyway, now that we've gone over some tips, I wanna deep dive into some questions with you and just try and apply these strategies. Keep in mind, I have never seen these questions and I may very well have no idea what the answer is and I, I might even get the answer wrong. And that's okay, I want you to see the process of me trying to apply these strategies, the process of me actually working through these questions in live time, but my hope is that by watching me work through these problems live, you're going to become more acquainted with the process of tackling difficult physics questions and sort of the thought processes behind them. Okay, so let's dive into this thing. This is the unscripted portion of the, uh, the video. We'll see if I can remember all of my physics equations. So right off the bat, I can see we're given a diagram uh, regarding the circulatory system. There's this sort of annoyingly, you know, a lengthy equation here. I'm going to skip that totally. And right away, I'm going to dive into the question. And I just want to see and ask myself, what is it that I'm actually looking for in this passage? I don't want to get bogged down in all the really heavy details. So I'll read the question. Assuming that pressure remains constant, which the following would lead to the greatest increase in bulk flow rate through systemic circulation. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> we just went over sort of a, an example of this. So I'm looking at this question and I'm asking myself, well, I don't even need information in this passage to answer this question. I just need to understand Poisset's law, and I need to understand, well, which of these answers here, A, B, C, or D, would have the greatest increase in Q. Now look at this, doubling blood vessel radii. If we were to double the blood vessel radii, we would have a 16-fold increase in the bulk flow rate. Why? Because we have to raise the radii of the vessel wall to the fourth power. And if we double the radii, then that means we're actually increasing flow rate by 16. I'm really comfortable with the fact that doubling the radii will have a 16 fold increase in the flow rate. And so I'm gonna go with B because that's what I'm familiar with. And we'll go to solution and look at that, it's correct. So I'm so happy that this was the first question because it was actually the example that we used in the intro. It was very serendipitous, which I'm happy about. But you can see, I didn't even need to look at the passage. Like I did not even need to like glance at it in order to answer this. I just needed to understand um, this equation and how any of these factors would increase Q or decrease Q. So again, very important to remember your equations inside and out and how to apply them and how to sort of rework them. 
So let's get on to the next question. A man has a heart rate and stroke volume of 60 BPM and 60 milliliters per beat. His systolic pressure and diastolic pressure are 120 over 80, respectively. For this man, which of the following is approximately systemic vascular resistance? Okay, so right away, I'm asking myself, what is the question asking for? Well, it's asking me to calculate something, so I know that I'm gonna need an equation. And what I'm trying to calculate is systemic vascular resistance. Now, knowing that I'm trying to find systemic vascular resistance, and I'll go to the passage and I'll ask myself, okay, well, I know that we have this equation here. So what is this? We have mean arterial blood pressure, the cardiac output, the flow rate through and systemic vascular resistance. So look at that. I found systemic vascular resistance in my passage. I now need to know how to calculate this. So MAP is equal to the product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. So right away, I can I know that I need to utilize this equation. I've been given variables for diastolic blood pressure and systolic blood pressure, and therefore I can find MAP. If I can find MAP, then I may be able to use cardiac output, and then I can just plug in all those variables and I can solve for SVR. So let's try and do that on camera. <laughs> for diastolic pressure, is going to equal 80 plus one third divided by three. And then I can do 40 divided by three, which is approximately 13. So 80 plus 13 is equal to 93. So MAP is equal to 93. And I'm gonna give it units. It's very important that you follow your units when you're doing these calculations, because oftentimes you can actually use the units and sort of reverse engineer what the question is asking for. So for instance, the units that we are looking for are millimeters of mercury times minutes per milliliter. And so I have 93 millimeters of mercury is equal to cardiac output times SVR. And so now I just need to find cardiac output. And so I look, okay, so we have 60 beats per minute and there's 60 milliliters per beat. So if I just multiply, 60 by 60, I know that'll get cardiac output. So there's 3,600 milliliters. That's cardiac output. Excellent. So now we just have a really simple algebraic equation to solve, which is 93 is equal to 3,600 times SVR. We just divide 93 by 3,600, and we can put this into scientific notation to make it a little easier for ourselves. And I see it's 2.2 times 10 to the negative two. So after we divide MAP by cardiac output, we just do some math, and we find out that SVR is approximately equal to 0 0.02. Now I look at my answer choices and I say, okay, well, the only answer choice here, or rather the closest answer choice, is A. Let's find out if I had the right answer. And I did. And again, no, I did not look at any of this information. I just asked myself, what is the question actually asking of me? I found out what I needed to figure out from the question. I went back to the passage and I used the equation and I just used some logic and, and reasoning and algebra to essentially just figure out the answer. This is the first video of a little series that I'm doing. So if you enjoyed it or you found it useful, be sure to subscribe, stick around. So I know that may have been confusing and it was sort of difficult to work through and I didn't really know what to expect filming a, a live work through of a question, but I'm sort of glad that it happened the way that it did so that you could see my thought process Maybe you could gleam some information from how I approached the question. And that way, when you start to practice your own questions, getting into the physics section, you can start to apply these principles as well. Again, ask me your questions in the comments below, or you can follow me on Instagram and DM me there. I really do love each and every one of you that come back to this channel. So thank you so much. I love y'all. We'll see you in the next video.